The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. As we know, truth comes in all kinds of forms, humor being one of the most uh, interesting and enticing forms. This past week, uh, I needed a good shot of humor and found it uh, in some of the quotes from one of my favorite comedians, Stephen Wright. And if you've listened to Stephen Wright, you know that he's really good at mixing in truth and humor. Uh, And he's got a very dry style. I'm just going to share with you a few that I came across this week. And uh, imagine Stephen right here with his, his baritone voice, deep voice, deadpan style, speaking to us this morning. Now, there's a lot of truth in these. Some of them are even profound. You may even want to commit some of these to memory. You never know. You'll see. The first one. <clears throat> they say the universe is expanding. That should help with the traffic. Second one, I think it's wrong that uh, only one company makes the game Monopoly. (laughs) A clear conscience is usually the sign of a bad memory. I like this one. A lot of people are afraid of heights. Not me. I'm afraid of widths. (laughs) You can't have everything. Where in the world would you put it? If you think nobody cares about you, try missing a couple of payments. How many of you uh, like to cross-country ski here? Oh, a lot of you, okay. Uh, This joke's for you. Cross-country skiing is great if you live in a small country. (laughs) Think about that, all right? And my favorite one of the bunch, if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving definitely is not for you. (laughs) Definitely not for you. There's a lot of truth to jokes and laughter, and uh, thank goodness we can laugh because sometimes it takes a while for the truth to sink in. But for even greater truth, for deeper truth, lasting truth, today we hear from our Old Testament lesson in Exodus the ancient truths that have sustained us ever since they were first given to the Hebrews. Now, most of us have heard of the Ten Commandments. We've grown up at a time, many of us, at least where we committed those to memory. But that's in large part because here we are in church. We are people of the Ten Commandments. But for more and more of our culture and for younger and younger generations, these are unfamiliar words. They know very little about them. What do people think of when they hear the word Ten Commandments in our culture today? Do they think about strictly murder and adultery and stealing and all those kind of do not kind of commandments? Do they even stop to think that the very first commandment is not do not, it's simply 
you shall keep the Lord your God before you at all times. In other words, honor the Lord your God, right? You shall have no other gods before me. That's a provocative, controversial commandment even in our culture today. But what about us? What do we think of when the commandments are, are spoken? Many of us, of course, went through confirmation where we had to memorize the commandments in order, maybe even the meanings. And maybe we've retained several of the commandments, maybe we can recite some of them, but I would venture to guess that few of us could name them all in order. That would be asking a lot. But if I were to go out, or you were to go out, and ask someone on the street in the coming week, uh, do you know the Ten Commandments? Can you name the majority of them? It would be interesting to see what their response would be. They'd probably say, who, me? Do I know the Ten Commandments? Well, uh, maybe one or two, maybe. Could they name all of them? Not likely. But first of all, they might say, why are you asking me this? And after that, they might just say, well, well who cares about the Ten Commandments? Who cares about some dusty old moral codes or some ancient belief system. What does that have to do with my life today? Well, Jesus cared very deeply about those old dusty moral codes and, and laws. In fact, so much so that we hear in the Gospel today that as he entered the temple, he was overstricken with rage that they had turned his father's house into a marketplace. The heart of the law, the very purpose for worshiping God, had been put into making money. He was very disturbed. <clears throat> On this third Sunday in Lent, it's our Protestant tradition to read the Ten Commandments, to have this text from, from Exodus 20. And it's important to look at this because here God speaks to us in a straightforward, very succinct manner. We're not to argue or reason with God over these commandments. They simply are stated. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery, and so forth and so on. And here's what you should do. A list of things. Martin Luther looked at the Ten Commandments and would, would say that when God speaks to us, he often speaks to us at our most basic level, in baby talk even. And here we have these ancient Hebrews being spoken to by God in such a language that they can understand. We see that God loves us always in a way that also teaches us. God is loving and teaching, loving and showing and instructing. God gives us the direct language that hopefully we can understand. And so again, God speaks to us, not just in the Ten Commandments, but in many passages throughout our liturgy because, again, most of our liturgy is scriptural-based. All of our language, hopefully, is straightforward because it describes how things are. We have so much conversation in our culture today about what we think about this and that. We are opinion-based. We are poll-driven. And everybody's got a different opinion about everything. And we throw up those polls and it seems that we even maybe even in some circles worship polling has a sense of truth we collect all the opinions and that's our truth statement how would God have settled for that with the ancient Hebrews not so well every Sunday we read from these old Hebrew scriptures that we call the Old Testament we read them so that we too can continue to receive the same love the same instruction, the same care and concern that God offered his people leading up to our day and age. And that history is so important because even back then, God was giving them the ability to reach into their history and to understand better how they got to where they were so that they could do his will, just as we do here in worship. It must have been humbling to realize that of all the people, all the nations of the world, God chose those Hebrews to give his Ten Commandments. And then through the, the New Testament, we continue here to read Old and New Testament. We continue to see that this loving, this teaching, this commanding continues through the new law in Jesus Christ. Again, God continues to love and show us the way in Old and New Testament through the old Adam and the new Adam, his son Jesus. 
A lot of people are turned off by the Ten Commandments because they may think of them as some harshly imposed or unrealistic demands upon our lives. We want freedom to do what we want to do. We don't want to be held back by some, again, some old restrictions. But are the Ten Commandments really restrictions? Do they hold us back or do they liberate us? They are always, always God's gift to us. They are not the opposite of grace, but rather the tangible, continuing proof of God's grace. They never were about restricting the good life. They have always been about leading us to the good life. They are, in fact, as I said, gifts from God, which then become the very definition of grace which runs throughout the whole Old Testament. God gave the Hebrews and continues to give to us instructions, guidelines, so that we too are not left to simply wander through life in a sea of opinion polls telling you what you should think and what the opinion of the day is. God did not take a poll. God gave us his love through this law and through his son so that we might discover that our way through life is not our own but through God's eyes. And so we encounter today in Old and New Testament not the datedness, not the out of style, not the old-fashionedness of the Ten Commandments. But when we come here and worship in Old and New Testament, regardless of where in Scripture we point, we are always recognizing the continuing validity of God's presence and love for us. As I said earlier, all around us we recognize these sad, pathetic efforts of people again and again trying to lead their own lives and take us with them. Living by their wits, again by the wisdom of the day or even the moment, versus the wisdom of an eternal and everlasting God. Here, God reveals to us the real structure of life. The way that this life has always worked and will always continue to work. And so this is how we are meant to live and walk and think and breathe and talk. How we are to interact, how we are to care for one another, love one another, instead of constantly opposing one another. Rather, we are called to lives of peacefulness, of honesty in dealing with others. Honoring our elders, not taking what does not belong to us. All of these. And in the culmination of Jesus, who gave his life for us, we find the real path to genuine happiness. That is why you and I come to worship. It is here that we hear the real truth. We know who loves us. And we celebrate that grace in humility and joy. With so much out there telling us so many different things, you know that when you hear the scriptures read in this place and in this time, it is the truth for you, for all of us, and for all time. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks again today for your eternal word, a word that speaks to us and gives us an anchor, a foundation. Lord, when we find ourselves torn and pulled in so many cultural directions by so many voices and so many agendas, Lord, calm our spirits and our minds by your word, by your commandments, and most of all, by your love in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that here we see reality, that here we learn the truth, and that here we know what it is to love one another as you love us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.